In December of 1965, residents of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, not only saw, but actually found what many claim was a vehicle from outer space. The object was clearly seen not just falling, but appearing to land in the woods nearby. Within two hours, armed military forces of the U.S. government literally invaded this small Pennsylvania town, retrieved the object, and hauled it away. What was it that fell or landed near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania? Does the U.S. government have an authentic UFO in its possession? We'll attempt to discover the truth in this chapter of UFO Diaries. For 30 years, Kecksburg, Pennsylvania has been a town divided by a bizarre controversy. Many of its citizens claiming that nothing out of the ordinary has ever happened there. While other residents claim that in December 1965, this Westmoreland County village was briefly the home of a crashed UFO. What is the truth about this strange metal object that witnesses say crashed in the woods near Kecksburg? And why do some of them say the local people were ordered to keep quiet about what happened? Was it because they'd stumbled across some top secret government project? Or because they'd seen an object that proved the existence of intelligent life on other planets? To learn the truth, we must return to that December afternoon in 1965. It was approximately 4.47 p.m. when the object impacted in the woods of Kecksburg. There are a number of local residents around Kecksburg who saw the object get down into the wood area. While none of these people reported any type of sound of impact, almost momentarily there was a column of blue smoke that rose up out of the woods. According to the eyewitness accounts, Kecksburg residents soon rushed to the spot where they now saw smoke rising through the trees. There, they say, they discovered a metallic object partially buried at the bottom of a ravine, still smoking from its long descent through the Earth's atmosphere. Kecksburg resident Jim Romansky says he was one of the first to locate the object at the bottom of a densely wooded ravine. Here was this large metal object in front of me. Um, I've described it as a large acorn. And the reason I say the acorn is because around the bottom of this object, there was a bumper that went the whole way around this thing. It was dented and it had a very distinct color. I mean, this thing was a, a, a bronze, copper, steel. Uh, it was a color that it's, it's very hard even to describe. Then, according to Romansky and many other witnesses, armed U.S. soldiers arrived with trucks and other heavy equipment. You know, the military started coming in. We were under martial law, jeeps, trucks everywhere. Down through the woods, come two guys. Trench coats, crew cut hair, straight as ramrod. He looked around, he looked at the object, he looked at us, and a very authoritative voice told us that this area is now quarantined, it's restricted, to get out. According to Romansky and many other witnesses interviewed by Stan Gordon, the object only remained in the ravine for a few hours because the soldiers who had so quickly arrived on the scene then recovered the object and took it somewhere else. Here comes this big flatbed truck, tractor trailer, okay, two piece job. And on the back of it, it either had a, either a, a tow motor, that's one of those things you're lifting with, or a front loader. The back of this flatbed, they had this big tarp on it, and it was stretched down around this object. And it had the same outline. In fact, I know I could see the bumper under this tarp, because you could see the shape of the thing. The tarp was pulled so tight that you could see the shape. And I knew in my mind, that was what they brought down off that mountain, the object. Military truck with a flatbed trailer with the object on it departed late that evening from Kecksburg. And from information we now have, the truck continued on and it went to Lockbourne Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio, where it stayed over for a short period of time. From there, it went over to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. It seems very likely that our government had tracked the object and they had notified the quick response recovery teams that are involved in this type of operation.
But since the object was apparently taken away, never to be seen again, it might seem that as far as the residents of Kecksburg were concerned, the incident was over. But according to a number of the eyewitnesses, the most terrifying aspect of their encounter with a UFO had really only just begun. John Murphy, who was the news director of WHJB, felt that the story concerning the object at Kecksburg was of great importance. So he did a lot of investigation on the case and interviewed a number of witnesses who had been involved or had knowledge about the incident. What exactly did you see? Well, I saw well, there was an object falling and it was burning. Is that exactly what you saw? Yeah. It was in the shape of an acorn. It was falling from the sky on fire, and it came down very smoothly and then landed in the woods. And it had some sort of writing of some yeah. sort. You couldn't figure out what it was. Right. Are you sure it wasn't like uh, Japanese writing or something? Not or Chinese. Nothing I've ever seen. Nothing. Very different. Are you sure this is? Uh, you're you're saying it's a spaceship now, not anything that. Yeah. Absolutely. It was very, Absolutely. It was very bright. Absolutely. So what is the situation here on the? home front around here with all the soldiers. Maybe we, don't, we don't know what's happening, so it's very frightening, very frightening. According to the witness accounts, something seems to have badly frightened a good many of those who had seen the unidentified flying object and who had witnessed its recovery by the military. This is John Murphy. We're going to cut for a quick commercial break. Hello, this is John. Hi, John. Hey, Sally, how are you doing? That was a great interview yesterday. You and your son did a good job. Well, you can't air that. Why? Because I made a big mistake. Oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, it's just not, it's not the right story. What? Well, people make mistakes and I was wrong. Thanks a lot. Bye. It seems as though something must have occurred between the time of the interview with John Murphy and the time that the radio special was to be aired because of the fact that these people were willing to be interviewed and then suddenly they decided they didn't want their name or any information aired with this report. Why? What happened to cause the witnesses to refuse to make their testimony public after they'd been so willing only hours before? I think these people knew that something had come down and the military presence was so strong that night that a lot of people who they, the military knew, seen something or lived real close to it was either told to be quiet or were bought out or something. You guys listen up. What you saw down that field, it was nothing. Erase it from your memory, okay? Don't tell your mom, don't tell your dad. Don't tell anyone. You got it? The government does have an official policy on UFOs. They are not vehicles from any other planet. But they do know that some UFO sightings actually are piloted by alien life forms. What are you doing? What are you doing? This is our town. So one likely explanation for the behavior of the military at Kecksburg is that they knew they were dealing with a spaceship. But is there any way to prove that the object in the woods really was something not made by human hands? More remarkable clues to the true nature of the Kecksburg object when UFO Diaries returns. How can we learn the real truth about what landed in Kecksburg in December 1965? Is it possible that we are in fact on a wild goose chase pursuing the truth about an event that never really happened? Many local residents agree that something fell to earth at Kecksburg, but some claim that government soldiers did not hurry to the scene or retrieve an object from the woods. There has been uh, some debate over the authenticity of the event at Kecksburg, that nothing fell at all in the woods that day, that what was seen was only a meteor. But Jim Romansky says he has maintained for 30 years that the meteor story was the one given to some Kecksburg locals by the military. Someone said, hey, what the hell was that up there anyhow? And the guy hollered back, oh, they, it was a meteorite. And I looked at one guy and we both bust out laughing. Because we knew there was no meteorite. Along with orders to stand by that explanation. You understand what he's saying? Good. I hope you do. Because if you don't listen, I'll kill you. 
With a 30-year-old debate dividing those who were in Kecksburg at the time, is there any way for us to really know the truth about the object that landed in 1965? After all, we don't have the object to examine. But is it possible for us to learn the truth by eliminating the explanations that simply do not fit the facts? As a researcher of this case and other type of UFO phenomenon, it's always our position to try to find a logical explanation for what people see. I think, first of all, we can rule out the fact that the incident in Kecksburg is a hoax. Something did occur there that night that created a lot of activity, and the fact that the military apparently responded in the way they did indicated the fact that this was something that was important to our government and military. The bright fireball object was reported first in Canada, then over a number of states including Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. So a lot of people did indeed see something. But does the sighting of a falling, flaming UFO prove that it was some kind of manufactured object? Or might it not simply have just been a meteor? Meteors are pieces of rock and other debris that burn up by friction in the Earth's atmosphere and normally moving at a very high rate of speed, thousands of miles per hour. It seems that whatever the object was here, it made several different turns, unlike that of a meteor, which would normally move on a straight path. Those people who observed the object before it impacted indicate the fact that this object was moving very, very slow, almost gliding in, and indicated the fact that even some of the flames around the object could easily be seen individually. A flaming object that made a controlled landing, a metallic shape without joints or seams, strange markings unlike anything on Earth, the rapid military deployment. If all these clues are based on fact, do they indeed add up to describe a vehicle from another world? There are a number of witnesses from around the Kecksburg area that indicate the fact that the military began to arrive in the area probably within about a couple of hours after the impact. The military apparently did not all arrive at the same time, but they periodically began to come into the area, indicating that they may have arrived from different locations. It's highly unlikely that military personnel would quickly respond to report of a meteorite. This is something that would commonly be done by civilian scientists. But according to Jim Romansky, the military not only arrived quickly, but immediately took over a central building for their own purposes. And as we approached the fire hall, I mean, man, you'd have thought there was an invasion going on. I mean, there were jeeps and cars and trucks parked all over the place, all military, okay? And there were uniforms everywhere. And as we tried to approach the door to go back into the fire hall, there were two armed sentries, or guards, whatever you want to call them, standing there. And they refused us to go in that fire hall. In fact, one of our guys asked to go in to go to the bathroom. And they said, uh-uh, see the weeds over there? Go. It reminded me of some of the war pictures I've seen where these people, military people, come in and declare martial law. There are numerous documents that indicate the fact that the United States government has had in place for many years a system for handling the recovery of space objects that safely re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. It is very likely that the specialized recovery teams would only have responded if there was something of great importance to the military. This would have been most likely, one, some type of foreign space device that had landed on our territory and they would like to have studied, or two, that this may have been something more unusual, such as the possibility of an extraterrestrial spacecraft. What is the official U.S. military answer to all of this? Do they say that the object recovered at Kecksburg is some top-secret spy satellite that accidentally dropped out of orbit? Or do they admit the possibility that it might be something not of this earth? Stan Gordon tells of his quest for the answer to that question from the files of the Air Force's 662nd Radar Squadron. There are indeed records that indicate the fact that there are specially trained intelligence team military personnel that are on call to quickly respond to crashes of space objects that survive re-entry of the Earth's atmosphere. The 662nd Radar Squadron was assigned as a NORAD surveillance site, and Air Force documents verify the fact that at least a few personnel of that squadron were directly involved in the investigation at Kecksburg that night. However, when we look at the historical records for December of that squadron, there is no entry whatsoever of any activity on that day. That leads us to believe that this mission was classified and the paperwork went up the ladder somewhere else. The question is, why after so many years is our government still not telling us all the facts it knows about the Kecksburg incident? What is so secret about what they found at that location that even today they refuse to comment about the incident? 
It is not disputed that the military gathered up and hauled something away. But what was it? The mystery would take on a new and more surprising twist when reports of a secret Russian satellite suddenly began to surface. Could the episode at Kecksburg be fallout from a failed Russian space launch? More astonishing developments in the mystery of the Kecksburg incident when UFO Diaries returns. There seemed to be only two viable explanations for the object that crashed at Kecksburg. Either it was part of a top secret American or Soviet satellite project, or it was some sort of vehicle from another world. Remember that by 1965, both the United States and the Soviet Union had the capability of putting nuclear weapons in orbit, and each was desperate to learn about the technology of the other. These rockets had segments that were jettisoned in flight and that fell back toward the Earth, presumably to burn up on re-entry. This practice has continued to the present day, and we now know that sometimes large parts of these space vehicles do not burn up entirely. Occasionally, a rather large fragment will actually reach the ground intact. There has been a treaty on the books for many years that if something of foreign origin would fall on our soil, we would recover it and give it back to the launching country. Remember that the American military would have been very interested in recovering a Soviet probe such as Cosmos 96. It would have told a great deal about Russian technology at that time. Particularly, if there was any reason to believe that the object was part of a Soviet weapon system equipped with nuclear missiles. But it may be now that after so many years, and the fact that both governments now are on a much more cordial level, the fact that they would rather just overlook the incident and forget about what happened so many years ago. Could the Kecksburg object have been a Soviet missile system, even a nuclear weapon, that accidentally fell to Earth? Weapon-bearing satellite systems are not designed to make soft landings. If indeed the object that came down in Kecksburg that day was a part of such a weapon system, it first of all would not have made a soft landing, and secondly, most likely there would have been massive destruction in that area. Cosmos 96 it was launched on November 23, 1965, but its booster failed. On the same morning of the Kecksburg incident, and that occurred in Canada. There are indeed some similarities to the shape of the two objects in question. Uh, there was a tiny bit of resemblance, but that's where it stopped. Was the Kecksburg UFO a failed Soviet Venus probe? If so, does this also explain the strange hieroglyphic seen on the object by more than one witness? I mean, it was like circles and stars and dashes and all kind of markings on it. Writing, you sure it wasn't like uh, Japanese writing or something? No, or Chinese. nothing I've ever seen. Nothing. Very the different. external markings or identification markings that we have seen on many of the Soviet probes at the time would look very unusual to people who are not familiar with the Russian language or the type of lettering. And in fact, if the object had re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, there could have been some scarring and burning, and they could have looked somewhat distorted from the re-entry. My dad is originally, originally uh, from Kiev, and I went to him one time and I said, Dad, I says, you could read and write Polish and Russian. He says, yeah. I said, write me something in both dialects. He says, what? I said, just write me anything. The Polish and Russian writing that I see doesn't come nowhere near it. And yet the simple fact that Cosmos 96 did fall to Earth on the very same day as the Kecksburg incident is still sufficient evidence for many people to believe that they were one and the same. Then again, according to Stan Gordon, perhaps we shouldn't make up our minds just yet. We have to look at the possibility that one, that the object in question may have been man-made, possibly Soviet in origin. I mean, the Venus probe, you had seams, you had pieces sticking out, you know, it was that quick that I could look at the picture and say, uh-uh, it wasn't it. Because I've been a machinist for almost 30 years now. And I've cut a lot of metal. And I've never run into it again, never. Surprising new evidence that may show where the Kecksburg object came from. This could have been an extraterrestrial spacecraft. When UFO Diaries return. The object that crashed in the woods at Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, has been the source of controversy and speculation for three decades. But are we at last approaching an explanation? 
There do seem to be many reasons to believe that the fallen Russian space probe, Cosmos 96, was the object seen by so many on that December day in 1965. Particularly since we know that Cosmos 96 did crash on Earth on that day. But we must still consider several other important facts about Cosmos 96. The Cosmos uh, Venus probe may have been a lot smaller than what people described at the site of Kecksburg that day. This appeared to be a one-piece structured object. They didn't see any rivets or bolts or seams on it. And in fact, they mentioned no type of external apparatus for sensing different types of information, which is very apparent on many of the Soviet space probes. Documents from both the U.S. Space Command and the Naval Surveillance Center verify the fact that Cosmos 96 did re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at about 3 a.m. in the morning in Canada. And yet, without the object itself, there can be no final proof. Is it possible that it still might be held in some military storage facility? And if so, where? We've already learned of one attempt to trace the object's recovery and how that search led to a dead end. The Russian embassy indicated the fact that they had no knowledge that Cosmos 96 or any other Soviet device had crashed in Pennsylvania on December 9th, 1965. Information obtained from the United States government indicates the fact that we had no re-entry of any American space debris or any type of weapon systems that could account for the crash at Kecksburg on that day. The official document obtained from the U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book, which was their UFO investigation program, stated that the object which was involved with the Kecksburg incident was a meteor that had been observed over a large area. All I can say about that is the people that are saying this are lying. When we look at all the explanations for what we have concerning the Kecksburg incident, I believe we can roll out a hoax, we can roll out the incident involving an airplane crash, so we have to look at what possibilities still exist. Oh, I think it was a UFO. And our most likely explanations would be that we're dealing with either a man-made space probe. Like nothing we've ever seen in this world. Uh, so you're Very saying different. definitely this is an alien ship. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, definitely. From some place other than here. If we can eliminate those possibilities, and we have to deal with the fact that we might be dealing with an actual extraterrestrial spacecraft. Investigation to the incident of Kecksburg continues. And until we have more information, this is only speculation as to what the object might really be. Something did indeed fall from the sky that day in December of 1965 into the Kecksburg woods. The military responded very quickly, located the object and recovered it, and took it away from the site. Kecksburg used to be just like a lot of other small villages in western Pennsylvania. But in 1965, Kecksburg lost its anonymity when it became one of the world's most famous UFO landing sites. I happened to look up in the sky and I seen this red fireball. It, it sure wasn't a meteor, because I've seen them fall before. I've never seen any of them with blue lights on. And it looked like it made a, a turn and come back again. And when it came back, it seemed like it went down. It was December 9th, 1965, a night that many townspeople will never forget. I got my flashlight and I started down through the woods up to where it was at. There was no wings, there was uh, no tail section, there was no motors, there was no windows, there was no doors. It was big enough for a grown person to stand up in. It had like Egyptian writing, like backwards writing on it. Stars and circles and dashes and lines and things like that. It looked like uh, an acorn. It was really weird. Some claim the UFO wasn't the only thing to arrive that night. It wasn't too much longer. Uh, down through the woods come two gentlemen. The one gentleman, very ramrod straight, very authoritative voice, crew cut hair. I mean, he just reeked of military. He looked at the object and looked at us. He says, all right, this is now a restricted area. Unions are all ordered out of here. Some military people come to the house and said they'd like to use the phone they they sort of took the house over we started talking among ourselves what did, what's going on about that time up here on the road comes a big flatbed truck in the flatbed went down and empty and it come back out with something on the back of it covered up about the size of a Volkswagen that truck was hell bent for leather and if you'd have walked out on that road you'd have still been there because they'd have scraped you up with a putty knife they weren't stopping for anything or anybody and that began the real mystery of this whole thing 27 years later, what happened down there in that woods surrounded by fields, if anything happened down there at all, is still a matter of bitter controversy. 
you've got this town split into two groups. you got the believers and the non-believers. There's been some friendship lost, and, and it's, it's foolish as far as I'm concerned. I have a brother-in-law that uh, he hadn't spoke to me for two years and said that I lied about everything, but I never lied about a thing. you got neighbors and neighbors that has known each other all their life. Now they don't want to talk because one believes it and one don't believe it. Just as the town is divided, so too are experts who have researched what really happened in Kecksburg. Planetary expert Robert Young believes that some citizens may have perpetrated a hoax. He claims the UFO was merely a meteor known to have passed over Ontario and several northern states that evening. Virtually all of the accounts can be explained by people having looked toward and seeing the Ontario meteor. How about the accounts, though, of the military that turned out in large numbers, kept people away from going down there, a truck that went down into the area and came out. You got eyewitnesses that say, this happened. Right. I, I understand. I've, uh, I have uh, written, signed eyewitness accounts from 61 local people who say that that did not, that there was nothing crashed here, it was recovered, there was no military occupation. A lot of people and, probably think you're the government. Well, sure, yeah, but I'm not. I don't know how some people can say that nothing ever happened when there were so many people that saw things that night. Something had to happen. I know what I saw, and I'm not going to deny it. They can tell me I'm lying, but I know that I seen the military in my house that night. Freedom of Information Act states there was 212 military personnel here that night. Sightings attempted to speak with the Kecksburg residents who deny anything extraterrestrial ever happened here. But they all refused our invitation to talk. Even the landowner whose property was the alleged crash site remained silent. I think the government bought them off or threatened them with something that got them scared half to wits. Ironically, their refusal to talk has only deepened the controversy. UFO researcher Stan Gordon heard about the Kecksburg incident on the radio the night it allegedly happened in 1965. He's been investigating the sighting ever since. So much of what we know about the case now, we've learned since about 1987, with the fact that now we have at least four different eyewitnesses who apparently saw the object on the ground at Kecksburg. The fact that there are dozens of people independent of each other who don't even know each other yet, who have given us detailed information about what they experienced and saw that night, and they're giving us confirming information that has not been published yet. The skeptics, and these include the people who own the land and some very substantial citizens of Kecksburg, think that this whole thing is loony. Mm -hmm. Why do they feel so strongly the other way? Could be that some of these people were in the wrong place at that time. They were in a position where they didn't see what was going on. And if you see the geography of the area and where the majority of people were that night, they could not have seen the military activity that was happening on the land on the other side of the area down there. Do you have any hard evidence at all that what went down in the woods near Kecksburg was something other than a meteor or was anything at all? Unfortunately not. As in so many of these cases, you have to go by the eyewitness accounts. And in this case, the eyewitness accounts are very, very strong. And uh, again, unfortunately, we don't have that type of information. If this was the case, whether it be a space probe or in other UFO cases, sure, if we had the physical hardware, the mystery would be over. What do you think it is? What do I think it is? At this point, and again, this is not conclusive, at this point, the weight of evidence would point in the direction that this may have been a Soviet space probe. If the object were proven to be a Soviet space probe, then many questions would be answered. If a Soviet device landed in Kecksburg, the government would have been required by international treaty to recover and return immediately any space debris to the country of origin. But retired Army Sergeant Clifford Stone doesn't believe the Soviet probe theory. If this was of Soviet origin in 1965, the State Department would have released documentation to me under their moon dust files. To date, none of that information has been forth. Clifford Stone collects government documents about space debris recovery operations, like Project Moondust and Project Blue Fly. He began his investigations in 1965, when, as an Army sergeant, he witnessed a top-secret delivery to Lockbourne Air Force Base, about 200 miles from Kecksburg. I noticed that on the back of the vehicle, it had something that was covered by a tarp. It was about uh, 10 to 12 foot at the base, 12 foot tall. It looked like a chocolate drop. When my friend told me that uh, every question I ever had about UFOs 
was under that canvas. I was mystified. Since that time, Stone has repeatedly attempted to obtain information from the government regarding that object. Each time, the government's response has been the same. They have taken the stance, by direction of the President of the United States, we may neither confirm nor deny the existence or non-existence of any information that all involve the recovery of unknowns. Kecksburg remains a town divided. The only thing on which believers and non-believers can agree is that all they want to know once and for all is what really happened on December 9th, 1965. What would you like to see happen next? It's time now after 27 years that the public has the right to know the true facts regardless of what the object was or what really occurred. Something came down from numerous eyewitness accounts to a, a lot of military activity into the small village that an object was located, that it was recovered, it was transported away for study. What was the object and why after 27 years haven't they revealed what really was found? Joining us now from Houston is space flight engineer and author James Oberg, who has studied the reported sighting in Kecksburg and has his own theory about what landed there in 1965. Mr. Oberg, first of all, do you believe that something crashed in Kecksburg in 1965? And was it a UFO? If it's anything, it might be something a lot more Earth-like. It might be a spacecraft from Russia and not from Mars. It turns out we do know that a R Russian probe fell back to Earth that day. And it was a special kind of probe. It was one of their probes to the planet Venus. It failed, was trapped in Earth orbit, and eventually fell out of orbit. What might have been on that Russian space probe that the U.S. would have been so interested in? Oh, the most important thing about the probe would be the heat shield. How thick it was, what material it was made out of, how heavy it was. And once we knew that, we could then analyze how big their warheads would be in their ICBMs. The same kind of material was used there. Also, their most advanced electronics would be in that probe. Their most heat-resistant kinds of, of materials. The very best of their entire military-industrial complex technology. It would have been a treasure trove in terms of the Russian space and missile technology. Do you think we will ever know with certainty what really happened in Kecksburg? Well, I guess the dream is that someone will come forward with an official government report. It might exist, it might not. Uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, people's memories, as you know, tend to keep changing and growing as the stories get told and retold. I think there's lots of stories in UFO folklore that uh, we'll never really know what happened behind them. That's the fascination. Well, first of all, uh, we were in a field hunting for this downed aircraft, and the first rescue team already found it and radioed into the fire hall, gave the coordinates, and it was down in front of us, and we hightailed it out of our search area, went down into there, and we got there expecting a smashed up airplane. Wings, fuselage, etc. No such character. Came down through the woods, and here's this humongous piece of metal laying there. I mean, this thing, I've described time and time again as a very large acorn shaped object. The front of it, or I presume was the front of it, was pushed down into the dirt where the way it came in and landed after it took out the top of the trees and brush and everything coming in. Came back in an oblong shape. Around the bottom was a, what I call a bumper and then the bottom was perfectly flat. No signs of propulsion or anything. There was no doors, no windows. Uh, there was no ways of getting in this thing at least none that I seen. There was no seams on it, no rivets, nothing. The only thing I seen was this bumper around it and it had these real strange markings on it, which I've often referred to as similar to the ancient uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. So as a volunteer fireman, we did what we were supposed to do, find the crash site, do a preliminary investigation for survivors or treat anybody with it, which we didn't because there was none that we could see. There was no way of getting in this object. The first team had already ready in his position. We're there 10, 15 minutes all talking around, doing a preliminary search, wondering what we discovered. Two gentlemen come down through the woods, trench coats on, ramrod stiff, crew cut. All right, this is a restricted area. You're now ordered to get out of here. Now, wait a minute, I'm a civilian. You ain't gonna order me nothing. But as a fireman, I'm being relieved from what I'm doing. So I got out of there. We're going out through the woods. We didn't go no more than 15, 20 feet. And I know from me to you, here come the military. Full uniforms, equipment, marching right down through the woods with flashlight. This is December. It's late in the evening. It's cold. It's wet. How far away were you from a military base? 
Well, the closest base that I knew of was Pittsburgh, which was approximately 45 miles to the west. So within 15 minutes of your arrival at the site, the military was there? You got it. Okay. All right. All right. Now, what did they say to you after this happened? I mean, I know there were several members of the report I saw in Unsolved Mysteries. Several members of the community were there. People, right? Other people that were part of the community were there and present and were all told to leave. There was no press or media at the immediate crash site. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know up on top of the hill, because I come in through the side, the military had taken over a farmhouse. I mean, from what I understand, military brass. They took over up there, did all their orders and whatever they were doing from up there, and that's, that's where I presume that the military who came down through the woods came from. Because when we went out, we had to walk back to the fire hall, which was approximately the way we had to go, I, I'd say a good mile. But by the time we got back to the fire hall, it was wall-to-wall -wall military. I mean, there was trucks and jeeps and cars. There was guards on a did door. Any, did anybody say to you, I don't want you talking about this, don't say a word about this, or were you did, what with they that term, did, debriefed? What they did. I mean, these people virtually told us just to shut up, get to your vehicles, and be quiet. And you did what you One were told. One of the guys even asked the guards at the door, look, I got to go to the bathroom. Now, these guys are standing there with weapons. Whether they were loaded or not, I don't know. None of us were brave enough to try to find out. He said, I got to go to the bathroom. They said, see those weeds over there? Use them. Well, by that time, we just headed for the trucks. Well, let me ask go ahead, James. I, got an, I have a daughter and a son that both went into the military within the last two or three years. One went in the Marine Corps, one went in the U.S. Air Force. My daughter come to me from the United States Marine Corps, and she said, Dad, your name come up on a computer as my father. I had to sign a statement saying I would never ask a request for any information from Kecksburg. My son had to sign two statements. Oh, about you? About yourself? Pardon? Uh, any information about yourself? You had to, your daughter had to sign a paper that says she would not ask for any information about you? Not about me, no, but about, about Kecksburg. Folks. Okay, my but name what come up as her father. Okay, but you know what? Then, no, wait a minute, Montel. Okay. Then my son in the U.S. Air Force had to sign two papers. One. Jim, wait, get to, just jump to the chase, because <laughs> right. part of the chase here is the fact that I spent, I'm telling you, I had some of the highest clearances this country has to offer. I've been through files on top of files on top of files. I still ain't seen nothing yet. But did you have period. a need to know? But do you, period. You, you didn't have yeah. a need to know. Yeah, you but that, that, that's know. also now not my true. my son goes in the Air Force and they tell him he can't even request to go to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for duty because I seen something and that's where my UFO was sitting well, maybe today. It's a, maybe well, it's, I did watch. Wait a minute, maybe his MOS was something that they didn't have a qualification for at Wright-Patterson His Air MOS Force. has nothing to do with it. Okay, all right, hold on The man. government is covering this up. They don't want no one to know. They don't want no one to get access to anything because they're afraid people will find out the truth. The technology, you was in the third wait a second, hold on. You uh, really uh, believe uh, the technology we got today, we came from up here? No. Wait, 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 Maybe wait, wait, some wait. of it mm -hmm. did.